Hello, welcome to Spotlight. Okay, we're here with the legendary. I mean, what, what other way can we use to describe him? Peter Davison. Hello, Peter. I'm going to make that part of my name, I think. The legendary. <laughs> Rather than the sir, which I'll never get. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for being on the show to start with. That's a pleasure, very, pleasure. very kind of you. Um, of course, we've been reading this book, Peter Davison, Is There Life Outside the Box? An Actor Despairs, which is a nice take on An Actor Prepares. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is a great read. And one of the things that comes out in it is very much your real lovely personality and you call it an act of despair and i know there was some controversy of the title you know in the book you talk about different titles yeah. but you know yeah. an actor despairs why not bask in the success that you've had as an actor you can always look at your career and go i've been a complete failure you know i, I, I think i mentioned this in the book but i'll repeat it I, I, i've been a complete failure i'm not making multi-million dollar movies you know, I'm just going from TV series to TV series. Uh, and at the same time, you know, a, a, a mo great big movie star can be in despair because he's not making the really top prestigious thing. So we all have a way of looking at our career where we think, yeah, I can look at myself as a success, but I can also look at myself as a failure. And those things can be just as depressing. I remember very definitely when I started out, I was initially known as the bloke from the vet series. And then you were known as, oh, the bloke who plays Tristan. And then, well, I, I suppose it wasn't until Doctor Who that people then connected with my name. And it's becoming much harder to do that now in, in the modern world with masses, masses of entertainment coming at you from every platform. When I started out, uh, uh, um, television was still being made very much in the old style uh, uh, of video studios where... Uh, if you look at the early Doctor Who's, and it was a frustration, but it, 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 it's absolutely fine. It's of its time. It was very much a theatrical style because British television was based, came out of theatre. Theatre directors moved into television and really much filmed it as if it was a theatre. Whereas in America, it came from a different, a, a, a different style, a style of movies, uh, was then imported by television. And we've caught up now. Um, uh, 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 um, so I can look back at those early ones and go, I think they just move the camera or get us to move around the set a bit rather than just stand there and then we all run off at the end of the scene. Um, uh, but I was on the cusp of it. So I moved from the old way of making television on television into a more filmic way. I've managed to keep going long enough to see that, that change. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a great change. I mean, now, nowadays, there's virtually no difference between you know, the way a movie is shot and the way a television series is shot. Um, let's, let's go back. You recently starred, um, the most recent thing on television would probably be the Christine Keeler drama, um, which was absolutely excellent. Um, but for the students who wouldn't know uh, the process, could you take us through the process, even just on a basic level, the process of you're sitting in your living room, you've never heard of this thing, to recording your first shot? In, in the old days, when I was at the golden uh, time of television and, and I was sort of flavour of the month uh, for a, a, a while, people would ring me up and uh, through my agent and say, would Peter like to do this part? This is an offer. That's the big thing. Uh, um, and occasionally I still get a phone call saying they would like you to be in this series. Uh, uh, this is an offer. Uh, it, but let's, let's forget that happens. Um, mostly what happens is you get a phone call from your agent and now, nowadays you do a self tape. Uh, these are very big things that now, now, you know, you, you get home, they give you a scene, you have to shoot it and then you send it in to the casting director. And I guess that she sits through hundreds of these things uh, 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 and decides which one she'll pass on to the director or the producer. Even high profile actors like yourself, they, they would ask you to do that. Um, you know, wh whether I do those things rather depends on whether I think it's a stretch for me. If it's a stretch, I'm very happy to do uh, a self tape uh, just to show that I can do it because you, but if it's a part that, that I've played a kind of character I've played many times before I usually get a bit sniffy about um, doing a self tape and um, because I'm thinking why why am I doing this you know um, either they think I can do it or they they don't but if it's a stretch so I mean uh, 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 um, for example it, it recently um, I went to meet the casting director for the Christine Keeler series uh, 
so it was effectively an audition um, with the director that was and I didn't hear for a good couple of months that they they offered me the part I did a series called Gentleman Jack um, uh, which was written by Sally Wainwright that was a straight offer but I'd worked with Sally before so that was fine and I've just done a series which theoretically should be coming out in the next few months called Life uh, and that was an offer um, so it, it, it varies really with, with me I, um, and uh, I, I, it's, of course it's much much nicer if you if you get a straight offer but if you don't you go along and you do the audition and if you if they like the self tapes they'll they'll call you in to meet the director um, and then uh, um, if you're lucky that you'll get offered the part and then I never believe I've got a part until the costume designer rings me up <laughs> I mean, that's the test that's the test of whether <laughs> I'm actually doing it even though my agent will ring up and say, okay, here's the deal. Uh, and they'll, you know, go through it with you. I still don't believe it until the costume designer, because that means the team is assembled. Uh, and um, that's when things start moving. You go to, you know, the makeup department ring you up. Um, and you sometimes get a, a, an email from the director of the first couple of episodes saying, you know, uh, if you like to chat, and, you know, or, you know, sometimes they actually I'll invite you out for lunch. It's extraordinary. Oh. Um, and and then then you've got the read through. The read through is possibly the worst uh, uh, thing you could possibly have to do ever because you have. Uh, it seems odd saying it in these times, but you'll have up to 50, 60 people in a room. Uh, some around the outside edge will be the technical people, and then around the in interior table you'll have the cast, and you'll have the director and the producer. Um, uh, and the ex very executive, various executives, and then you have to sit down and you have to read the script. And, and this is where you start to think, are they going to realize they've made a terrible mistake <laughs> in, in, in casting me? Because, and of course, the irony is they have all these actors sitting around reading the parts and we're all thinking exactly the same thing. We're all thinking, oh my God, everyone thinks I'm terrible. <laughs> and you don't have time to think about what everyone else is doing because you're so concerned with, oh my God, am I getting away with this? <laughs> uh, and uh, if you get through the read through and they say, well done everybody, that was amazing. Then you figure you pretty much have got away with it. Except that sometimes they'll go, they'll say to you, okay, we're just going to go into the other room and talk for a few minutes and then we'll come back to you oh. and decide what we're going to do. And then you think, what are they talking? I have known an instance, a very famous, I will not mention the actress concerned, uh, but they, I was not on the show, but it, it happened in the BBC rehearsal rooms where they did the read through and they, the, then the producer and the director went away into another room to discuss it. And then they called the actress in. She was playing a leading part in this series, called the actress in. And then a few minutes later, she came back and just got about and left because they decided they made a terrible mistake and she was recast. Um, uh, uh, so it, 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 those things do happen. They, they don't happen often, but enough to just, you know, make you feel slightly nervous. <laughs> uh, and then you, because um, you, you used to in the old days, in the days of uh, uh, All Creatures Great and Small or Doctor Who, you had a, a period of rehearsal um, a, a good couple of weeks rehearsal of the scenes. Now you tend not to have any rehearsal. If, you, if there is a rehearsal, it maybe is, you know, you'll read the, the scene maybe once or twice uh, after uh, uh, in the days following the read through. But largely after the read through, you go away and then you turn up on the day of the filming for your first day, having had no rehearsal at all apart from doing that read through. Uh, and then you'll just block it through. Uh, uh, and you kind of get used to how to play it uh, with the other actors just in those few minutes while the lighting department is lighting, the props department is setting up the props. Um, so you have to pull everything together much, much quicker than you used to have in the old days. Uh, and it, it surprisingly, I don't think it makes that much difference. So all right. for all the two weeks of rehearsal we had, you have. To, I am obsessive about um, knowing my lines because I feel much more comfortable if I absolutely got them in, in my head and then I find I can play with them a bit more and change things. There are some actors, some young actors, 
who don't think it's uh, uh, the thing to do to know your lines. They like to have, yeah, they like to keep a very loose grip of it. So it's almost like it's coming into their head at the last minute. Brilliant if you can get away with it. And there are some actors who can do it. And there are many actors who can't. So I prefer to be safe rather than sorry. Uh, uh, and, and so I'm a, a very good studier of my lines because I think that's part of my job. My job is to turn up, know the lines and to hit the marks they put on the floor when you do your acting. And that way, I think, even if I'm terrible, even if they think I'm terrible, they can feel so, yes, but he can hit a mark. <laughs> <laughs> he knows his lines. Uh, it's really the angles. When we did Christine Keeler, I, the big courtroom scene where I had to give my speech, I had to do that scene and it was a big, long speech, the, the, the summing up. I had to do that scene about 10 times, that speech about 10 times from different angles, with the camera here, the camera there, uh, over your shoulder, zooming, coming into you. Uh, um, but I remember, you know, I remember years ago sit, sitting in on the rushes for All Creatures Great and Small. And we, we had done maybe three or four takes of a scene. And... Um, I'd sit in the room with the director and the, like, the cameraman and we'd watch the rushes. And after the first take, everyone would turn to each other and go, that's fine, why did we do it again? Mm. There was, so at the time, there's some kind of thing where the cameraman thinks, I could have been just some two inches more to the left and that would have made that shot so much better. Or the director's thinking, I could just maybe have just you know, asked, him, asked him to do that a bit stronger. Uh, but in reality, when you see it back, nearly always, uh, um, the first take is the best. You've done your shoot. You've done your shoot day. You've gone home. Is that effectively the unless you're called back for some ADR? Presumably, that's the next time you're. It, the sad thing is, when I'm watching television now, I can tell exactly when those things have happened. So you can always tell as the uh, the actor turns away, and then there's a line that's been added on the shot of the actor's back of the actor's head, which says something like, "Well, let's go back to the warehouse now to check if the stuff is still there." And you think. That's just added to make you know. <laughs> uh, so it kind of ruins the illusion for you a bit. Um, but anyway, so you go back and do a bit of ADR. I had to do a bit on uh, 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 Christine Keeler because of uh, 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 both those things. One, the line wasn't clear, and one, they wanted me to change something at the end. What would you consider to be useful director notes? Have you got any examples of really useful director notes to established actors like yourself? Or, and unuseful notes what would be the sorts of things that you just wouldn't say to an actor <clears throat> um okay this is, i'm going to be diplomatic here <laughs> <laughs> no the thing about i'll tell you what the thing about there are some directors who i've worked with whose work i think probably is very very impressive but who when you are doing something clearly don't notice your uh, you at all so in other words what their concentration is the frame how it looks, uh, you know, the feel of it. But actually, I've done scenes where I've done set entirely the wrong lines. And at the end of the take, the director said, um, okay, that was great, uh, let's move on. And I said, uh, do, you, do you know, I said entirely the wrong line. And they go, did you? Oh, I didn't <laughs> know. Said, okay, let's do another one. Um, what is um, the best thing? It's just the feel that the director is noticing what you're doing if you feel confidence in the director noticing what you're doing you know that if he's not happy he will come and say something i worked with a director years ago um uh, called M martin friend uh, 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 who um I, I i love the way he was i did a series called anna of the five towns which is the very first thing i did after um doctor who and also he directed a, a, a campion um and he used to at the end of a day <laughs> come up and go Absolutely marvelous. Let's have another one. <laughs> and you think that, that, in a way, that's the best. That's the best thing because you're you're saying you were brilliant. Let's do another. Yeah. <laughs> so, you boost your confidence at the same time as saying, let's just have another go at that. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, you, although you might know he's lying, and actually he's thinking he wasn't very good in that scene. So let's do another. Actually, the, the fact that he's saying this, not. I mean, actors work on that very superficial level of. <laughs> you know, people come around to the show afterwards, uh, after you've been on stage or something, and they come around to the stage door and they'll go, oh, absolutely wonderful. And you know damn well they've just been <laughs> saying, what are we going to say to him? Because he wasn't that good, you know I mean? We'll just say, uh, just say wonderful, just say wonderful. Uh, um, 
so <laughs> but we know it's a lie but if you don't say anything if you don't say that we they automatically assume you think you're, you're terrible so uh, you all go through this these these <laughs> I know it's it's frivolous, really. But... <laughs> you, I remember, <laughs> I remember years ago actually when I um direct, was asking when we were doing the Terminus DVD documentary, and I remember asking you you uh you know about directing, and you said uh that you could do it. I remember, I remember you were very passionate about it. You said <laughs> I I thought I could do it. I could be a director. And I thought to myself, great, yeah, I bet you probably could. Um, and then you went on to do the um, to do the the Five Doctors thingy, uh, the oh, Five Doctors. Yeah. That's it um, for the fiftieth anniversary. Well, now that you've been a director, <laughs> right? So how how was the experience? And were you right? Could you do it? Because obviously you did do it. And moreover, how, how did actually you directing the other doctors, which I imagine oh. must have been a bit of a bizarre thing? How how was that experience? Uh, I think I could do it, actually. Uh, I, I mean, I'm, I wouldn't say that I was up there with the, the great directors, but the fact is, when it when it came to it, uh, uh, um, I was able to keep an idea in my head of what I wanted, and I was able to convey that to the the the, 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 the cameraman, uh, and uh, I was able pretty. Uh, uh, um, Diplomatically to to direct my fellow doctors, although there are a couple of moments. <laughs> Dallas, <laughs> you got a bit dodgy. Um, uh, but again, you 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 the the big the technique I, I I learned from various directors, or did I just glean it? I don't know. Is that the best way to direct people is to give them the idea that it's their idea. So even if you're saying. You know, when, when we first read through, there was something brilliant you did where you conveyed that to me that, uh, just do it, like, try, and, try and do it like that. So if they think it's come from that, if you say, I've got this idea, why don't you, it doesn't work so well. But if you kind of give them the idea that it was their idea in the first place, it, it works very well. Uh, where I think I couldn't be a director is that uh, on the Five Ish Doctors reboot, I suppose it was a difficult one because I, I'd written the script. Um, but I, I realized that I was not at all uh, amenable to changing things oh, that, really? that other people wanted. Yeah. And I know that uh, um, on Doctor Who, for instance, you know, if you're a director, you, you, or, you're always having to bend to the, 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 the pressures of the uh, um, producer and probably higher up than that who say, we want this to be like this, we want this to be like that. And you have to cut things you don't want to cut. Uh, and I, re I realized when I was doing it that I was stubborn. I was far, far too stubborn to be a, a, a good director in, in uh, certainly in television. Really? Maybe, a, maybe, a, maybe a multi-million dollar movie I'd be fine at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? And you had, there's too much compromise uh, uh, that directors have to cope with and accept, be accepting of. And maybe I would learn that. But the fact of the matter is, uh, I, I was enormous fun directing it. I mean, a, a Five Ish Doctors reboot, and I would be running around, you know, looking at shots and looking at angles, and the, you know, the location person would be taking me to a various place, and I'd look across uh, at uh, 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 um, uh, uh, Sylvester and Colin, and they'd be sitting in a chair having a cup of tea. Yeah. <laughs> I've been thinking that is what I have been doing for the last. 40 years or so, just sitting around having a cup of tea. Um, and now here I am, and it was exciting. It was exhausting, but it, it was very, it was very exciting. But, but uh, overall, uh, an actor's life is pretty easy. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I hesitate to say this because I don't want it, uh, some people to go, actually, actors are pointless people. But the, the truth is, uh, uh, on a set, I think actors work least hard of anybody on a film set. You know, they they spend most of their time wasting time sitting around reading a book, chatting, uh, being to, being told to keep quiet, while everyone else is rushing around preparing for the take. True, our faces are on the, the camera, and everyone is uh, uh, they're they're bent on pampering us. Uh, uh, um, but I've always felt that you know 
everyone else is working much harder than I am. <laughs> in the book, yeah. in the book, um, I, there, I just picked out a quote that I just thought was a bit, it was just, I, I suppose it was something I just never expected Peter Davison to say. And that was that you find some, I, I don't, uh, that you find somebody intimidating. I mean, intimidation is quite an interesting thing because, and I'm going to share with you that when I first met you, um, you know, having been a, uh, you know, a, a guy, a kid from Belfast who was, you know, not in any way connected to television, but growing up with you uh, effectively as the Doctor. In fact, my first episode that I ever watched was Castrovalva. And years later, um, oh, when we were doing um, one of the DVDs, it was Enlightenment which was your fault, actually. You won't know this, but you made a you made a, a comment on one of the DVDs uh, where you said, I can't remember which DVD it was, um, but you said something like, right. I think they should recut an episode and add some new effects. Oh. And then, what? Oh, yeah. yeah, and then Dan, who was the executive producer listening to that, lumbered it on my shoulders, as you know, Peter Davison said. And so therefore, but it was ironic because the turnaround on that was, so we recut Enlightenment special, we recut Enlightenment. Did you see it? The Enlightenment special edition. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, uh, but yeah. ironically, the weird thing was, that Fiona Cumming, who, uh, the late Fiona Cumming, who was just uh, such a wonderful, wonderful woman, she spent five days staying with me at my house. So here was the really weird thing that I had Fiona Cumming <laughs> staying with me in my house. Yeah, well, we, we kidded out the guest room and everything. Uh, and she stayed with us as she cut recut the Enlightenment Special Edition. Oh, so right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So oh, she, she stayed over. So... Um, and then, uh, and then we did it again. She came back about a year later and stayed for another five days, where she we were recutting um, uh, uh, Planet of Fire, I think it was. We did that, right. um, and uh, but it, 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 it's 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 really weird how um, you, I was intimidated by having Fiona in the house and then meeting you because I was kind yeah. of like, oh God, you know. I suppose, in a way, I just leant back on my professionality and just went, you know, well, I'm a TV director now, so yes, you're gonna, and and you're gonna meet your your heroes, which I'm gonna come to in a sec. But the quote was, "Working with Diana Rigg was intimidating." Well, I suppose first of all, you know, I, 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 one of the series I grew up watching was uh, um, the Avengers. Yeah. So that so uh, it was that, but she was she's, I'm, she, I'm sure she's a lovely, lovely woman, but. And I, I, you know, I don't mean to be intimidating, if I am intimidating, but she, I think part of the problem was, I, I'll tell you the whole story that, that, that yeah. this is Bradley Mysteries. Um, I was offered a part in one of the episodes, which uh, wasn't really, I wasn't big enough. So I, I thought rather than just say to my agent, uh, uh, you know, turn it down, I'd say to him, uh, there's another part in there of this, this uh, inspector, this, this police inspector you know uh, i wouldn't I'd, i would play that and they came back and said okay it's an offer now what i didn't realize at the time that i accepted that yeah. was that this inspector christmas would become uh, um the love interest of mrs bradley <laughs> now there was a slight age difference between diana rig and myself <laughs> and uh, um uh, and so the idea that i was her kind of <laughs> love interest. I mean, I was sort of chasing her. I mean, in fact, I turned out to be a baddie, but uh, uh, I was chasing her. And I had this line, I can't remember if I mentioned this in the book, where I, we were sitting at dinner one evening and we were sort of a bit of banter. And I said, uh, um, uh, well, you can be the cream in my coffee any day, Mrs. Bradley, which I thought was the worst line that I, I'd ever have to say in my <laughs> life. And and she, when I said it to her, she gave me such a withering look. And I don't know if that was Diana Rigg or if that was Mrs. Bradley. I have no idea. <laughs> but it was, it was so... She didn't really say anything to her anyway. She very much kept... You know, obviously, she's, you know, she's the star of the show. She kept herself very much to herself. Uh, um, uh, and that was fair enough. But, but, you know, as you point out, intimidation is very much on the part of the person who's intimidated rather than the intimidator. I, f I think so. She probably had absolutely no idea that I was sort of terrified of her, but uh, um, it, it doesn't happen very often. 
to me, but uh, I think it was the, just a lack of commu- lack of communication added to which I felt insecure about the character I was playing. Uh, um, Mrs. Bradley's love interest. Yeah. Have you ever considered that you might have ever intimidated anyone? I'm I'm aware of it sometimes with when you meet fans. You know when you do uh, 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 and they'll ask for a photograph and you and they're literally shaking uh, um, in sort of terror or something. I don't know what it is when when you're having the photo. You know when you're allowed to put your arm around <laughs> and selfie. Now we'd be six feet apart. Yeah. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm aware of it then. I'm not, I, I don't think of myself as being intimidated. I, 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 when I started a job, um, I was talking to a friend about this a, a, a couple of years ago. Uh, um, I, I, when I am I starting a job, I feel I have to work hard, quite hard to be liked. I want to be liked. I want people to think I'm an okay, you know, person. I don't want to intimidate anyone. I think there are maybe some actors who like to come in being, this and being very kind of positive and so everyone goes oh wow they really want... me I, I prefer to be just you know nice old peter but i think sometimes i do intimidate people you know i don't mean to including people like stephen moffat when you had dinner with him for the first time as mentioned in the book <laughs> i don't know I, I think he might have been intimidated i don't know but he, he was impressing us greatly with his knowledge of doctor who he was showing off terribly well it wasn't his fault actually it was the other person who was holding the dinner party who was uh, uh, demonstrating the unbelievable knowledge of stephen moffat with regard to what happened when in any doctor who program from day one i think and I think I mentioned it, he, 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 he was shown a black and white photograph and he was able to say not only uh, which episode of which story it was from, but also how many minutes into the, <laughs> into the episode really? that picture happened. You know, about, I think it was about 15 minutes into that episode. Uh, uh, now, I'm, I, I, watched, I grew up watching Doctor Who from the time it started, but I, I'm not, you know, I couldn't tell you, you know, the names of all the right, stories right. and the names of the episodes or anything like that. <laughs> Daddy, but I don't know. Was I? It's interesting to know if I'd intimidated him. I'll have to ask him. But also, you mentioned that um, you mentioned in the book uh, about John Cleese as well, because you say about he was a hero of yours. He likes to undercut the idea that he has to be funny all the time. You know, he, <laughs> he, he never, he, he never used to like that. But of course, in undercutting it, he is very funny all the time. <laughs> he can't help it. But uh, uh, but he very much. So he talks to you. He was. He, he was. You know, he asks you quite pertinent questions. He doesn't just present himself. I am John Cleese, the great, you know, John Cleese. So I, I, I got on quite well with him. Well, I, he probably doesn't even remember me, but I, I felt that we, we, you know, I got on quite, you know, well. And we were in this strange, bizarre situation because we were the only ones when I worked with him. You know, we were doing this strange video where Prince Charles was appearing. Uh, um, it was a thing for the environment and he, he and I I guess were the only people in the cast who knew that Prince Charles were coming and was, was turning up oh, wow. <laughs> so oh. we, had this, we had this little thing between us he rang me up before and said um, when it says Prince lookalike in the, in the, in the script it's not actually it's, it's him uh, <laughs> that's very strange uh, but I liked I liked all these a lot Would you recommend meeting your heroes then? Yes, I would. I think I, I would recommend working with your heroes. I think that that was been a, it's been a that was a great experience to work uh, with Robert Hardy, John Cleese, and, and uh, uh, well, Diana Rigg. I don't know because because <laughs> I never quite I never quite got over the intimidation. And funny enough, I worked <laughs> with her daughter last year. Oh, really? And I, kept wanting, and I kept wanting to tell her the story about how I was intimidated by her mum, but. I was too intimidated by her to tell. <laughs> <laughs> I never quite got around to telling her. Anyway, I, I, I suppose you're right. A lot of fans probably would find you quite intimidating if they've never, never met you. But then they get to know you, and you know, they. I mean, I was reading. I was really interested in the book. You were. T- you did a a whole section on conventions, which surprised me actually. But I loved some of the bullet points. Uh, <laughs> My favourite one, I can't believe actually somebody would say this to you, uh, but my favourite one was, fans tell me I'm their fourth favourite doctor. Yeah, they do, they do. <laughs> and they say it as if I should be impressed with this. It's not like, it's not, they're, not, they're not saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're only my fourth favourite doctor. They come at you, they go, you're my fourth favourite doctor. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's like that's astonishing. Yeah. What do you think? What I mean, what goes through your head when you are doing those signings and signing your name for the multi? I mean, you must have signed your name a zillion times. Um, yeah. What 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 goes through your head when you are at these conventions? You know, what what are you thinking? There's part of me which has a certain amount of guilt because that I am there, you know, and they're coming along and they're meeting me. So I, I, I think that they, I think the reason they do it is not for the autograph, really. It's just for that 30 seconds or so of meeting you. So I try to be as, communi uh, you know, uh, uh, as outgoing and uh, gregarious as possible with them and talk to them and ask them a question. Because I think it's, uh, I think it's what, they're there for in that idea that you know and uh um by uh, it event, the american convention when you do an american convention you know it's three days long by day three the smile is fixed <laughs> in your face and you, know, you just <laughs> you have to go back to your night go <laughs> um so the, uh, day three is difficult to, to maintain your good humor but uh, um with the others you know they have come along to see you and a good number will say you're my favourite doctor. They're probably lying through their teeth, but I don't care. <laughs> they go to Colin Baker and that. Uh, yeah, exactly. The you're my favourite doctor. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but um, what's not to like about you know you're you're turning up and people are telling you how amazing you are uh, uh, for an entire day, uh, or you know it's and not because of you because you're played the doctor. Mm. I know that, but it's still. You know, uh, 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 four favorite doctor aside, uh, uh, not an unpleasant experience. To finish today, I wanted just to uh, uh, I wanted to just ask you one final question, and it's from the book. Um, you say, uh, "My daughter became an actress, married an actor, has had four children, who will probably all do the same." My two sons tell me they're going to sign up as well. And it doesn't stop there. My nephew is now an actor. My niece is about to leave drama school. And then in brackets, you write, incidentally, her brother, who's the production side, is about to work with my son-in-law. And they say, how did this happen? When you, uh, you must be really proud. I mean, now that's really something, isn't it? Uh, yes, of course. And it's wonderful. And I, I, but I, I worry about it because uh, um, if things are not, if things are difficult. As you said, I forged my career, if you like, in the golden period of television. And although many more things are being made now, uh, lockdown and coronavirus notwithstanding, um, the money is not there in the way that it was. People will, are asked to do things for very small amounts of money or sometimes no money at all. So it's very difficult to, to make a, a, a career. Um, I'm, 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 I suppose I'm... A, proud of being the catalyst of, of that I've been also slightly worried about the responsibility that 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 involves if if they find it hard and then have to change direction uh, there's one other way of, uh, a rather depressing way of looking at it which I can't tell if I put in the book or not is that you know I do think that when uh, um, my various members of my family look at look at me and go uh, uh, um, oh, I think I'm going to try acting. It's, it's they sort of look at me and go, "Well, if he can do it, anyone can do it." I'm going to have a go. I'm going to have a go at this. Uh, it can't be that hard if he's doing it. Um, and and you have to try and say, I, "I was very lucky." That's all I can say. I was very fortunate. In several instances, I was in the right time at the right, the right place at the right time uh, and managed to uh, wriggle my way into. Uh, parts what went one to another um you know very peculiar practice led uh, into campion um so it, 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 uh, so i've been involved it, it just things worked out very well i was fortunate touch wood uh, uh and um may continue um <laughs> and that what doesn't always happen for actors you know yeah. there are many many good actors who maybe never uh, uh, have this career they should have had, or maybe don't have it until they're, you know, uh, um, late fifties or, or sixties. They suddenly come into their own. Um, so uh, you've got to factor that in. It's not just looking at me and going, "Well, if you can do it, I can do it." It's the fact you've got to say, "Well, you've got to, you've got to have the same good fortune that this bugger has had." <laughs> and of course, you know, not only uh, then gets to write a book. Uh, but then also yes. gets his face on a postage stamp. 
<laughs> yes, <laughs> I've been on a postage stamp. You're the you're the uh, the fifth uh, the the fifth doctor and the fifth person to publish a book. So, what advice would you give to Colin Baker when he comes to read? No, I'm joking. <laughs> Write his. <laughs> A Life in Colour. Okay, like, take it seriously now. Don't just reprint those pieces from the Wiccan, <laughs> whatever it is, the Wiccan <laughs> one. I don't know. He's done that, hasn't he? Has, has he? Has he? Collected, collected pieces of journalism from the uh, uh, um, Wiccan Daily, I don't know what it is. Pr probably. Know, I'll, I'll ask him. Ask him. <laughs> ask him yeah. yeah. Peter Davison, yeah. thank you so much. And uh, Is There Life Outside the Box is available in all good bookstores, isn't it? It's not out of print yet. It's not like John Pertwee's where you I can't buy it anymore. Know, I don't think it is. I, I did think about starting the volume two. Do it! Do it! You Because know, there are bits, I know people say there's not enough about Doctor Who in this, so I was thinking, well, I could fill in the gaps if I wrote volume two. And it should never have been volume two, but uh, um, anyway, who knows? <laughs> if this goes on much longer, I might be forced to write another book. Yeah, well, do it! Do it! <laughs> Thank you, Peter. All right, cheers. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for being part of Spotlight. Okay, on the next episode of Spotlight, we have Claire Sparks, who's a production executive. Absolutely amazing insight she has. So please don't forget to subscribe to the channel and to join us on TikTok and Twitter at Spotlight1701. Thank you for joining me today.